It's ween. Ween? It's, yes, it's ween. Rhymes with teen. Okay. The same as same as weird. It's not German. <laughs> it's not German, but it's not German. Um, it used to be Russian, and it was Velik, and they changed it when they immigrated to the United States because the, the immigration official said, "Right, your name's Ween." Interesting. I like that history. I don't know any history behind my name, so there you go. Um, she is the author of Codename Verity and a whole bunch of other books, and the upcoming Rose Under Fire, right? It's coming out this year? Yes. 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 And she will be telling us a little bit more about it in a second. Um, let's see. Vicky is the author of Cleopatra's Moon. Vicky should wave if she can hear us. We can't hear her. No, I, I, I think oh, I figured I it out. We can hear you. Yay. <laughs> I had it accidentally okay. muted. I was about to say for a second, I was like, well, we can see you, so if you want to ask questions, you can type them on the sidebar. That goes for everyone. Um, and my friend Allie on the other side over there, um, we can kind of see her, but she can't see us. She can wave. Wave, Allie. Say hi. She's Maybe. moving her hand. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. And Sarah, she's also from our book club, and we have probably a couple people watching, and definitely one other person. Please introduce yourself. I was totally like lame oh. about it. Oh, my name is Elena. You said you came from Twitter, so what's your Twitter handle so we could all? Oh, uh, it's Novel Sounds. Okay. Yes, I know who oh, you are. Nice. I I know you. I don't know you. I know. Oh, you. really? Yeah. I just no, like. Not. Yeah. Sure. I. Yeah, I know novel sounds. Yeah, I just gush over you a lot, probably. <laughs> probably realize that. I know. I saw, like, your book was on her blog for, like, the best of everything last year. So. <laughs> yeah. And I think you even had a category about, like, the most, like, recommended or talked about book, and I think that was one of them. Yeah, like, like, I made, like, a lot of posters about Codename Verity, and, like, I've given so it to, like, so many people. Like... I, I wish you, you guys, you guys, when you do this, right? When you just spread the word like that, you you need to hashtag it CNV special ops. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Nice. There's someone else that just came in. Robin, are you there? <laughs> I see she has joined the chat. She'll pop up eventually, I'm sure. Oh, technology today. Apparently, it's not working as we as it should. Um. <clears throat> well, to get started, I had a question. I will pull it up real quick from a reader online that I think would very aptly kind of start off this conversation. Uh, here somewhere. Okay. Her name is Hannah, and she has asked, what inspired you to write the story about a spy and a pilot? Actually, before that, why don't you tell for those who will be watching this later what your book is about, Codename Verity? And yeah, and then you can answer the other question. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, that the the answer is in the question. It's about yep. a spy and a pilot. And when people ask me to describe it, you know, sort of in one sentence, I say, it's a World War II spies and pilots thriller about uh, the friendship between two women, one a pilot, one a spy. And I would say that what inspired your question was what made me decide to write a story about a pilot and a spy. Originally, they were going to be the same character. Uh -huh. So I was going to have, actually, I have another, I have a short story in Firebird Zoring, which is edited by Sharon in November. And it's about a girl who disguises herself as her dead brother and becomes a pilot, a fighter pilot, during the Battle of Britain in 1940. And it was doing research for this story that I discovered the Air Transport Auxiliary, the ATA. And in doing research for the story, I also kind of accidentally stumbled across the Special Operations Executive. And my original idea was to pick the character from that story, um, who was a pilot, and turn her into a spy. And that was kind of what I was playing around with when I started working on Clinton Verity. 
which obviously didn't have a title or anything at that point. And there was this great kind of flash of inspiration moment where I realized that I needed to split the characters into two. And that one was then going to tell the other's story. And this would this would actually give a, a structure to the book that kind of got me going, you know, really got me started writing. Well, that's very cool. So, what was what was that turning point when um, when you realized it had to be two people? Was it did you write and there was a scene in there, or was it just kind of in research? It was actually it was actually inspired by the um, it was a book we read for my book group, um, and it was the oh god the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society uh, by Marianne Schaffer or Schaefer. Um, and there was a character in this book who was she wasn't actually in she wasn't actually a character that ever turned up in the book. She was off stage the whole time, but she was really admired, and she's kind of like the the major character that everybody else always kind of harks back to. And she was so heroic, and I got sort of mad at her after a while. But she's great. I love the book. Um, but I sort of thought, oh, this is so unfair, you know, everybody has, you get these larger than life heroic characters and you wish you could be like them and you know you never will be able to be like them and we're always, you know, having to live up to these impossible standards. Why doesn't anybody ever write a book about a coward? And I thought, you know, that would actually be a really good story. You could, you could, you'd write, you could make it sympathetic. You know, you could have your main character be someone who's like broken down under pressure. And then I thought, actually, what you could do is you could set it up as her confession. And then I just sort of, and that was like the moment. That was when I thought, wait a minute, this is how I can tell this story. I can have a character who has, who is a coward, who has broken down, and she can be writing this under duress, and this will be her confession, she'll, and she'll tell my pilot story. And they can be friends, and that's how they know each other. And um, yeah, whether or not, I mean, you know, if you've read the book, you know how successful I was at making her into a coward. <laughs> yeah, not very, not very cowardly whatsoever. She started out as a coward. I can see that. I can see in the beginning you kind of can think about that a little bit because she is giving confession and you kind of think in a way that she's giving up, but at the end when you find out that, you know, she's giving these clues, it's kind of like, oh, well, that was the only way that she could do it. So it was it was kind of cool. I think I think that part of what makes it part of what makes it convincing part of what makes her story convincing <coughs> is that when I was writing it, I thought I was writing from a coward's point of view. You know, so I was, I was presenting this as someone who really has come to the end of their tether and has collapsed. And it was only kind of in hindsight that I thought, hmm, okay. Well, it was in, oh, something kind of blinked somewhere. Hold on. So um, Hannah's second question is actually kind of ties into this um, a little bit. She says, did you find writing the story like a diary was easier or harder than writing a regular book? Or, oh, this, you know, is, this is the easiest thing I have ever written in my life. <laughs> <laughs> the first, actually, the, the second part, the second part was harder to write because it was supposed to be a very different voice. and. I think part of part of what was so easy in writing this book, which is which is very very different from my other books. Okay, my other books are all set in sixth century Britain and sixth century Ethiopia, and so you have like a whole different set of you know cultural references and historic references and literary references that you're working with. And all of a sudden, I was writing a book that was set in the 20th century and had like, you know, 1,500 more years of, of literature that I could refer to. And the language, okay, it was a little bit different from the language I would use, but it was so much more like it than, you know, anything I had used before. And I actually found the voice of, of Queenie, of Verity, I found really, really easy to... Um, put together. It was 
there is a voice that I use in my own journals that's kind of the same same mix of, of snark and and highfalutin literary banter, which mm. I've never been able to capture in yeah. fiction. Mm. And it worked really well for this character, so it was really, really easy to write. But Maddie, um, um, so much. Where no, go you ahead. I was gonna. I was gonna move. <laughs> I was just gonna say that we have. This is gonna be really kind of a spoilerific discussion. You know, we've already dropped a few. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, we did not give a spoiler alert, but I think um, we've all read it, though, right? I we've mean, all read it multiple times. I guess. <laughs> I'm actually. I'm taking the computer with me, but I'm going to let the cat in. Oh, well then you should show us the cat then, since we're all like moving around. Oh, I'll show you the cat, by all means. You won't see me because it's dark in here. Come here, Hirsch. Oh. Oh, she's pretty. She's pretty. She's a monster. Oh, hi. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> She's like, let me go. He was he was thrown out of the house for trying to eat my daughter. So. <laughs> oh, it's much nicer and warmer now. I was getting a little cold out there, finally, <laughs> as you said, Evan. Does anybody else have any questions? I feel like I'm hogging the conversation so far. Anyone? Raise your hand. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, Let her hold the conversation. What did you say? I said, how can you not have any questions? I know, right? Come on, guys. I think they're being shy. So that's all right. I know. That's um, okay. Go ahead and play. I was going to say, Allie, I think she can hear us. She said she can hear us earlier. For some reason, her video is not quite popping up. Um, <clears throat> so she's going to be giving, us, giving me questions on the side, as I'm seeing now. She says, um, are we going to see any characters from Codename Verity in your new book? And actually, before we, you answer that, why don't you... Why don't you tell us a little bit about that new book? Okay, the new book, um, kind of what's out there, I, it, it happened very, very quickly, this book. Um, I was, I had a deadline for it, which I've never had, in fact, I've never submitted a manuscript before that I hadn't already written. Um, so this was, this was kind of a scary thing for me to start out with. and. They really pushed me to get it done, and now it's being pushed through copy editing. And in the UK, it's it's um, been brought forward a couple of months for publication. So I've never worked on anything quite this fast. And on the one hand, it's been really good because it's it's forced me to to just you know buckle down and work on it in a way that I you know not had had to ever do before. I've always been at leisure to tweak everything to perfection. And this one, um, I haven't really been able to do that. And but also, you know, equally I haven't been able to wallow on certain things. And it is so that that gives you some background about my writing it and putting it together. It doesn't tell you about the book. The book is takes place a little bit further on in the war. It takes place, actually, it starts about eight months after Codename Verity ends. And it introduces a new character, another air transport auxiliary pilot. And her name is Rose Justice. And this is, this is all, like, known information. You know, you can find this on the internet if you look hard enough. Um, and she eventually um, ends up, she ends up, doing a, a ferry trip to France after the invasion of D-Day, after the Normandy invasion. And she ends up in the wrong place. She, she, for one reason or another, gets lost and is 
found by a couple of um, German fighter planes and is escorted into Germany and she ends up landing at a German airfield and is then sent to the women's concentration camp at Ravensbrück. And actually the, the greatest part of the book, the bulk of the book, is what happens to her there. Um, so it's it's one of these things that I was, part of the reason I was waffling over, there are a number of reasons why it, I was kind of hanging back getting it written and everybody had to just sort of say, come on, you have a deadline. One was I found myself unable to write it unless I was warm. And it was just, oh, it was, it's so cold in this house during the day. And I would just like sit around doing nothing, you know, I'd sit around drinking cups of tea and not wanting to get my arm out of a blanket. <laughs> Try to get warm, right? <laughs> yeah, I would say, why did you turn the heat on? <laughs> no, 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 can't do that. Um, so, so this was, I, I had trouble writing it over, over the winter and I ended up actually, you know, just kind of scrambling to get it written during the summer. Um, and that is partly because so many people in books spend so much time being really, really cold. And it was just, you know, it was, it was kind of like doing my head in. Um, so there was that. And then there is the whole, the whole I am not worthy issue. Um, you know, what right have I to tell this story? Um, you know, I'm not a witness. I am not, I'm, I have no connections with any survivors. It's, you know, I don't want to sensationalize it. You know, how can I do it justice um, being the person that I am? So I, I had a hard time kind of coming to terms with that. And again, being forced to whip it into shape kind of helped to um, to stop that. So actually getting feedback from people, actually getting a lot of feedback from people helped to put an end to that uncertainty. I mean, I still have I mean, like your your editor and um, your critique partners. Do you have critique partners? You mean those were they the ones that were giving you feedback or? Yeah, my my editors. Basically, they were the first ones who read it. I don't have really critique partners. I do have. I now have a couple of um, of very loyal beta readers, um, but it's a very it's a very close circle. <laughs> And and they're not. In, I think they're not entirely reliable because they have been with me kind of you know for the last twenty years reading everything I've written and and they give me a lot of positive feedback anyway. So it's only when it gets out to the editors and to other people in the editorial department who don't have that close connection to me that I feel like oh this really does work. And and I'm and I'm now beginning to feel that. Yay! And my daughter's read it too. <laughs> my daughter, my daughter, this is fabulous. She was 12 when I wrote Code Name Verity. She was like kind of right on the border of um, being the target audience. She's now 15, and so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, she's become this little power fan. You know, she's she's. Started up a code name Verity fan page on Facebook and oh, that's <laughs> awesome. great! She's like she's the target audience, you know. She really is, and she's like pushing it on all her friends at school and oh. um, yeah. So I, I, she's a very harsh critic, you know. If she thinks something is boring, she will tell me so. Um, so she she has said very positive things about about Rose Under Fire. Is she is she, she a thinks, reader? She's a she's a good read. Oh yeah, she's a, she's a she's a keen reader. She's um lately she's just gone kind of like just really crazy. She's I had to go to the library and collect books that she had ordered online, and she I, they gave me this stack of like nine books, <laughs> sort of like everything Cassandra Clare ever wrote, and and. <laughs> <laughs> all the, all the, uh, I guess Veronica Ross is going to be two out, and some other series that I don't remember. And then she had to have like all the Hunger Games books out again because she wanted to write fan fiction and she wanted to refer to them. So it was like she's got this massive stack of books. So yeah, she is a reader, which is great, you know. I was, I was just gonna ask, um, like, what would she recommend for us to read? Uh, What's her recommend for you to read? 
What is her top favorite book of 2012? Do you know? Her top favorite book of 2012? She would she would probably say Codename Verity just out of loyalty. <laughs> we'll agree. She, she, yeah. She, yeah. She takes her, she takes her, her role as, as Power Fan very seriously. <laughs> um, she, I think she really liked Divergent. She, um, she, she had not heard of it before. I, I guess that's not 2012. Wait, I get them mixed up because I haven't read them. It counts. Yeah, I think the sequel came out last year, so it counts. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, the sequel came out last year, but she hadn't. She had to read the first one before she read the sequel. So she she really likes that series. Um, she's read a bunch of books that are um, available in the UK that I don't know if you'll have heard of. Um, one I think that she really liked was called Skin Deep by Laura Jarrett, and the other the other author that we share. A love for is Hilary Mackay, who uh, wrote the Casson Family series. She wrote, she's written Sappy's Angel. That's like the first in the series. She has one that's just come out um, called Bunny. Yeah. And they're 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 lovely books. They're like these heartwarming family books, and they're but they're also there's always this kind of deep and painful mystery at their core. Um, which does always get worked out well in the end, you know, not necessarily perfectly. <coughs> well, what's the the uh, the name of the author again? Or the book? Hilary Mackay. It's um M M C K A Y. And the first in, the first in her series. Uh, she's got she's got tons of books out. But the the ones I would I would sort of you know recommend you start with are, are the one I recommend you start with is Safi's Angel, which is S A F F Y apostrophe S, and it has it has a scene in it that is like the funniest scene I have ever read in the book. It, it's also a very moving book, but um, the, there there is just one scene in it that just kills me every time I read it. It's so funny. It's like this family of kids and this girl who's just got her driving license and they decide they're going to take this road trip um, from like somewhere around London, unnamed location around London where they live to Wales. And the, there's a, the youngest daughter is in the back seat making big signs to hold up to the other cars to tell them when it's safe to pass her. And, <laughs> Look out because she's crying. There's a dead fox by the side of the road. <laughs> Poor fox, you know. It 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 just it's it's kind of sweet stuff, but it's not cloying. I I think she's wonderful. So anyway, that series starts with with Sappy's Angel, and there are like six books in the series now. I'm gonna have to check it out. One and the, I think they're all available in the U.S. I think it, she's 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 well received in the U.S. They're a little younger, maybe, but. Um, the characters grow up as well. How many books in the series? Hmm? How many books are in the series? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep reading them as they come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Um, there's, there's, um, there's, I think there's four children in the family, and each one has a book, but then, like, her favorite character has, like, at least two books to herself and maybe another. I can't remember. They, they just kind of keep going. <laughs> and then she went back and wrote a prequel oh. to the whole series. So there's there's a, quite but a you few need books. To read the prequel. You need to read the prequel last. Last. Cause there, yeah, because there are like little jokes in it that refer back to the other things that have happened. Okay. And she also wrote, she, this woman also wrote, a sequel to a little, to a little princess, oh, which is wow. called Wishing for Tomorrow, which which is also a fun book. Oh, I like the little princess. I'm gonna have to definitely check it out. Um, well, to get back to Rose Under Fire, um, <laughs> yeah. Ali earlier asked, or if there are oh, going to be any that question? <laughs> uh, yeah, if there are going to be any new characters. I keep looking at it and I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> There's, a, there's like a pile of new characters. There's the, there. Maddie is in it too. You you will recognize Maddie. She's a sort of mentor character, mentor and friend to me. So she's she's there. 
So we kind of get to see what she's been up to since yeah. the wrap up. Yeah. That's kind yeah. of cool. Um, when you were um, researching for Codename Verity, um, what was, um, did you do like an outline? How did you plot out your story and what kind of research did you have to do for it? I started out, I, I, I started out without an outline. I started out just like, it was just kind of, I was channeling Verity, okay? <laughs> I had no outline. It's like, oh my god, I have to write this down or I'm going to die. <laughs> And and that kind of went on for a while until I got to about, I think I'd written about 150 pages before I realized that it was kind of running away with me and I couldn't keep track of the timing and, and what was going on in it. And at that point, I had to kind of start dating entries. I didn't really want it to look like a diary, um, which is why I ended up dating her entries as though they're... as as though they're like administrative notes, but there had to be dates on them. Otherwise, it was just it was just way too confusing, and I, I couldn't remember when anything had happened. And the by the time I got to the second section, I actually had to stop, and before I could continue to write it, I had to come up with an actual timeline. Um, because the second section happens simultaneously with the first section in you know in many places and everything had to match and that was really really hard to do so about halfway through the book I, I, I didn't draw an outline for it I drew a timeline and then um, when I finished the whole thing I actually went back and took it all apart and put it in chronological order, scene by scene. So there exists in my computer a file which is, you know, CNB in real time, basically. And and you get to read all every, everything that ev from both parts as they happen. And the reason I did that was just to make sure that everything did actually dovetail and. And, and and you'd find things like you know somebody would say something happened on a Monday and somebody else would say it happened on a Tuesday, um, so there was there was stuff that that needed to be lined up, um, but that there was research involved in that as well because the other the other kind of thing you you would have to line up was was moon phases, you know when the moon was full and when you could when all the all the flights that were made had to align with when it would actually be possible to make those flights. So I had in my diary I had all the all the moon phases for 1943, oh. <laughs> which would confuse me. <laughs> Look at wow. Um, so yeah, I mean the stuff like that. The actual the actual research, the um, you know historical background was actually more straightforward. Um, I did a lot of reading um, and the, the books that I relied on that most heavily are the ones that are listed in the bibliography. Um, and you know, and I did research online as well, particularly for details. And the other thing I did, um, just to kind of get a feel for the you know material culture and the language of the time was I read I read um, books that that were contemporary that were written at the time and, and watch movies that were contemporary as well. Have you read um, I Capture the Castle? Because I like, have. Yeah. You know, I have. I didn't read I Capture the Castle until after I had finished writing for Yeah. Because like I've heard people remark before, like Verity, first of all, like, what do you want us to call her? Like Verity, Queenie, or like Julie? Like there's like so many names. I never know what to call her. Well, this is the thing. I found that when when pe when it first came out and people first started reviewing it, um, I was just stunned at how people wouldn't online call her by her name, and it was like they were keeping her name secret. <laughs> and, and it's not a spoiler, you okay. know. I mean, Knowing her name is not a spoiler. There's, there's no big reveal in the book 
that's connected to her name, except that it is her name, and she doesn't tell it until she's after until she's finished telling her story. Yeah. But everybody is just like really, really protective of her name, and I just I found that so touching. <laughs> so I, I have always I have always called her Julie because that's her name, um, but in public I tend not to. So yeah. now I am here. I am talking to you guys. You know, spreading it all over the internet. Um, <laughs> but in public, and like, if you look at if you look at blog posts and interviews and stuff that I've done, it it will. I'll always refer to her as Verity, or sometimes as Sweetie. Yeah, that's. But I think of her as Julie. Yeah, because like I think of her as Julie too. But like, no one says her real name, so I don't want to no. like ruin it for I people. So. Do not say her. Yeah. It's like breaking. You know, it's blowing it's the cover. Like a yeah. Yeah. Uh, like a rule. <laughs> <laughs> a code name Verity Rule. Don't break it. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, I have a question, if I may. Yes, you yes. may. Okay, <laughs> because I've got I've got hungry uh, people in my family, and they're bothering me to to ask me. So, <laughs> so I want to get my question. In. <laughs> my <laughs> um, the book was so moving on so many levels, particularly you know this development of this friendship. And the lengths that they went to. I, I was just wondering, was that something that developed as you wrote, or did you have an intention to to almost, you know, like do a study of of uh, a female friendship? Well, I knew what the plot was. Okay, I started out. I had my my pilot and my spy, and my separate characters, and I had the the way I was going to tell the story the structure of the book and I knew what was going to happen you know I knew what was going to happen at the end and in order to make that work in order to make the whole great plot structure work I had to develop the friendship so basically started out writing the book and I had to build a friendship that was going to be strong enough to survive you know what I was going to do to it in the in the story and I hadn't realized what was going to happen um, before I started writing about it, but what happened was it became a book about friendship, mm -hmm. and that was just that was kind of an astonishing thing when I when I found myself doing it. But also, it was just so wonderful because I was I was really kind of pouring into it, you know, my own friendships um, that. It's kind of something. It's kind of something I miss now. I don't. I don't feel like I have close by me anybody who I shared that kind of a bond with, which I have in the past. Um, you know, I do have people that I feel that way about, but they're not nearby. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really wonderful to celebrate that. So it it became a story about friendship, and it was. As I said earlier, um, you know, I it was easy to write. It was liberating to write, and also I had I had nothing to lose. I had no deadline. I had no publisher, and I, you know, was just kind of taking my time and enjoying myself. So it it wasn't planned, but once I realized that's where it was going. It became something that I realized I was going to do as best I could. Mm -hmm. I, I had a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, did you purposely leave out like the whole romantic element, and did that make it a harder sell? Because I know like there's tons and tons of books out there who, especially in the YA market, really want to push the whole romance aspect, and because this book is so lacking in romance. Um, or, or whatever. Was it hard to sell? Was it hard to sell to an agent? Was it was it no. a difficult book? It, it wasn't. It wasn't hard to sell. Or did that actually make it stand out because it was yeah. so different from everything well, else? Know, when I had when I finished it, when I finished it, and and my my little small crowd of, of readers finished reading, and they read it in serial form. I was sending them as I was writing it in this frenzy of writing. I said, oh, wow. Really take time. And when it was finished, we all sat there, you know, sort of emailing each other and going, oh my god, there were more books out there about women who are friends. Yeah. And we were trying to come up with them, you know. We we're, we we're coming up with Anne of Green Gables. And, um, 
uh, there has been some discussion, uh, some online discussion of, um, but I think you know, I, what kind I, of books have this sort of friendship in them. Between. But I know even in our um, book club when we were talking about it, it was um, something that we liked very much because even though there wasn't any romance in it, it was more about um, their self identity and how they're such strong, independent girls um, yeah. and not cowards. <laughs> it was liberating. It was awesome. Well, well I, I think it is a love story. It's just a love story I mean, about friendship. Mm hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and 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 some people some people think that it is suggested or feel that it's definite that there's a romance between Maddie and Julie. And I kind of part of the reason I didn't bring romance into it is because it wasn't about romance, you know. So if you it, it's I, I sort of like to leave that up to the reader. You know, you can read rom a number of different little romantic threads in there. Um, and I, I think for romance, maybe what what we really mean is sex. You know, there's like no, there's no sex in it. There's no there's no physical um, attraction mentioned in it. And I just kind of wanted to leave that out um, because you, I don't think you have to have it there to have that kind of a bond with someone. Oh, I agree. And, I thought it was and, a fabulous book. I mean, it was perfect the way that it was. I just wondered if you had a difficult time sort of selling it. I didn't. Out. I didn't. I didn't have any trouble. That that was never. Nobody ever said, "Oh, this needs more. This needs more romance." I think every, most people. In fact, mm -hmm. I can't think of any. Some people. Some people don't like it um, for a number of different reasons. But I don't think that. Anyone has said, "Oh, this book doesn't have romance. That's why I don't like it." And I think that most people who do like it just find it really refreshing that it doesn't. Yeah. It's like, oh, wait a minute. There are other things out there that we think about. And there's no love triangle. Yeah, <laughs> which is so popular in way. Not that it's a bad thing, but it was very refreshing and um, a joy to to read. Um, now, when you were researching, did you ever find anything that was um, really cool and interesting that kind of um, stuck with you? I, do you mean like that I didn't get to include? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I keep, I find so much stuff out. I mean, there's just like so much interesting. The, the women who, of, of the ATA and the SOE, are just incredible, incredible people. And I kept going off on these tangents. Um, one of the SOE agents, Alice Dunionville, I'll say her name wrong, um, she's a French woman, and she had lived in the UK for a while, and so they you know, trained her up and sent her back into France um, as an agent. And she, when the war was over, wrote a book, well she wrote a number of books, but she wrote one that she became an air hostess in the late 1940s and this was kind of one of the few things that former SOE agents could do that actually offered them a little bit of the excitement that they had experienced during the war. And so she was she was doing long haul flying in the 1940s, and she wrote a book about it. And it was wonderful. Unfortunately, it's only available in French. Um, but it is this absolutely wonderful and beautiful travelogue of going to Egypt and having to you know being grounded there, and having to spend the night in the dust storm, and and the people that she meets along the way because the the passengers and the and the stewards basically all get taken to stay, the same hotel stay overnight. You know, it's this much more intimate kind of travel than it than it is now. And yet, there's so much about it that you recognize. So this is like really, really the early days of passenger travel. And I think that her descriptions of flight and of what it's like being in the sky and looking at the earth and the ground and, and looking at at the earth and seeing it as this, you know, small thing with no boundaries, no national boundaries, um, is very reminiscent of um, Antoine de saint Superi, you know, the author of Little Prince and Windsham and Stars, and it's from a woman's point of view. <laughs> so this 
absolutely, obviously has absolutely nothing to do with, you know, research about the war, but it was one of the things that I would never have discovered otherwise, and it was just because I liked the way um, this particular woman had been interviewed by the author of one of the books I used for research, and I, he quoted her a lot, and I just liked her style, and that's why I went off to see if she'd written anything else, you know. So there were a lot of very, very interesting things that I found out that way. And these, um, originally the reporter, the, sorry, the, the radio woman, um, Georgia Penn, was originally a reporter. And we changed that because all the reporters had been kicked out of France when the, when the or out of occupied Europe, in fact, when um, the Vichy government went out of existence. And someone suggested to me um, that I look into these women who did these radio broadcasts for the radio in Berlin. They were American women who, for one reason or another, had ended up in Germany and were doing this kind of propaganda work for, for the Nazis. And there, there are like a half a dozen of them. You know, who knew? Um, and all of them are there for different reasons. Um, some of them were tried after the war. One of them disappeared. One of them was found not guilty. They had no evidence against her that she was being a traitor. So that was, you know, yet another, another thing that people were doing that I had no idea anyone would have, you know, been doing radio broadcasts for the Nazis <laughs> as an yeah. American woman, you know. So there were there were a lot of things that, that I discovered and really only touched on or, you know, couldn't even mention. Interesting. Well, um, as you were writing, was I, I know you said you kind of knew the story already, but was there anything as you were writing it that kind of... Um, that was surprising or maybe shocking um, to you that you didn't see coming. <laughs> oh yes, yes. I well, I told you that um, I didn't realize that that Julie was going to turn out to be um, quite the character that she did turn out to be, and I didn't know what her job was. I didn't know what her, you know, what she was doing for the SOE before she went to France, and I had actually dropped myself hints. So she has to she has to translate at the interrogation of the German pilot that they bring down. I've written that whole scene. I had no idea that she was actually going to use this skill later on. So so she basically just kept stunning me. Anna Engel, right? Mm -hmm. No idea that she was gonna turn out to to be what she turned out to be. So yeah, things and and the thing is, when I would realize these things, it would be this like huge aha moment, and then I would like dance around because it was so obviously the way it was supposed to work. And um, everybody started out really kind of cardboardy and one-dimensional, and they really kept. They were all supposed to be just you know straightforward bad guys in the beginning, and they kept sprouting children and interests and <laughs> sprouting children. <laughs> Human characteristics. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. But there was a lot that surprised me about it as I was writing it. That was kind of cool. Yeah, even reading about Anna was very much like what happened here. Did not see that coming whatsoever. So that was kind of that was kind of cool. Um, now I have a question. What we didn't necessarily get to see what happened with her. Um, in your mind, what has happened, um, Anna? What's her future been like, or is there a future? Are you asking me that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would have happened? To Anna? What? I said, what would have happened to Anna? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I. I also I, I, I have to plead the fifth on this one. You know, careless talk box <laughs> justifies. 
<laughs> are we are we gonna see her, her again? Are we gonna see her again eventually? Oh okay. I have to go. Bye Vicky. Bye. Vicky. Bye Vicky. Bye bye. Say bye, Vicky. Oh, no. oh, another one. Oh, we should get them to wait each other. <laughs> Too cute. Thank you so much. This was great. Thanks for coming, hon. Bye. Feed them. Feed the hungry people. <laughs> that is interesting. Okay. Well, that's something to think about for sure. And does anybody else have questions? Oh. Um, what do you think of, like, all the covers for Codename Barity? Because, like, the UK one has a different one. The hardcover for U.S. has a different one. There's a re-release of the paperback with a different one. And the Canadian one, there's a different cover, too. Oh. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're spawning, basically. Um, the, basically, what happened was it came out, it, came, it went straight to paperback in the U.K. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're all different. They're all separate publishers. So they get to choose their own covers. Um, so, you know, the UK chose the one that you know, and the US chose the, the, the UK one is the one with the girl's head and the rose, and the US one is the one with the, the bound hands clasping each other. Mm -hmm. And that's all there was. The, the Canadian publishers used, this, used the US cover for their hardback edition. And then the Canadians were like, well, we're going to do our own cover for the paperback, um, which was cool. Um, and they actually have, they have so they come up with a, with a new cover for the paperback, which I guess you've seen, um, which has the, the close-up of the girl's face, and um, it's got some barbed wire across it, I think. And I think it is a very evocative cover. I like it a lot. Um, but in the meantime, the U.S., was planning a paperback of their own, and they went for a very different look. Um, this is the one with the bicycles on it in the, in the field. And I think with that, they're trying to kind of appeal to maybe a broader audience um, and to maybe book clubs. And it, it's, it's very gender neutral. I, it, doesn't necessarily suggest the same things that the that the hardback does, and I actually love the hardback cover. I mean, they're all great. I was a big fan of the hardback cover, but a lot of people found it really very disturbing, and um, a lot of people didn't like it. I guess. So I think they they got a lot of feedback on that. You know, every now and then somebody somebody who's high up in the in the um, publishing world will say, oh yeah, it looks like Fifty Shades of Grey or something like that. Or no, yeah. it's not about bondage. Yeah, that's what like and, the New York Times said. I remember that in there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's kind of like, oh, God, you know, because they designed it before Fifty Shades of Grey came out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's a, bit, it's a bit unfair. But, you know, I have heard people saying, oh, I don't want to read this on the subway because people will think I'm reading it uh, about Sex games or something. <laughs> Sigh. Yeah. I, I think it's I, I mean I really love that cover. I think it's I think it's perfect for the book, you know. And, and my husband, I have to admit, my husband said, Oh, it looks like it's a book about bondage. I'm like, you know what? The narrator spends the entire book tied to her chair. <laughs> Not inappropriate. <laughs> um so yeah. Um and then the UK is also doing a redesign because they're doing uh, um, they're trying to position um, Rose Under Fire and Code Name Verity as kind of you know companion novels, and so yeah. they have not really matching covers, but they're going to have similar covers. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of different covers out there. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering like how would it affect like Rose Under Fire because like companion novels like usually match, but there's like so many different covers to choose from. But it's like... The um, the cover for the American cover for Rose Under Fire is it doesn't it's not going to look like any uh, anything else that's out there. <laughs> I would say that the the Rose Under Fire covers are now nah, they're all different again too. Um, again, you know the UK 
Egmont, the publisher there, is, is streamlining them. They, they are making them go together, and, and they, they go together very well. Um, I think that the, the two hardbacks the two hardbacks in the U.S. will will balance each other as well. And what you know, if Rose Under Fire goes to paperback, they'll, they'll probably rethink that again as well. But I, it's something that they do have in mind, you know, when they're working on. I, let me think. The Canadian ones, they're not as much of a match, but again, they have kind of echoes of each other, so. There are, you're right, there's an awful lot of covers out there for one book. <laughs> um, a friend of ours and another girl that's um, in our book club, she was there, but her internet was not working. She just sent me some questions. Okay. <laughs> that maybe, maybe you cannot answer, I don't know. Um, then this might be another plea to say. Um, <laughs> she says... <laughs> This one you might answer, but the other one's a little. We'll see. Did, she says, "Did she? Did you always intend for Jamie and Maddie to have some romantic tension, or is that something their readers just picked up as they were reading?" Do you know, this was this. You asked about surprises earlier, and again, Jamie was like, "I invented him to die in the North Sea." Okay, he was supposed to. He wasn't no, supposed to shot down. <laughs> And, and and he was one of these. Um, he was he was one of these surprises, you know. It's like, oh my gosh, he's been he's been you know pulled out of the water, and all of a sudden he's becoming a character in the in the book. And and actually, he ended up then with a job to do. I mean, he became a, a, he's a secondary character, obviously, but he actually mm -hmm. plays quite an important role in getting people back and forth and and providing some narrative continuity and all this kind of thing. Um, and no, so no, I certainly didn't plan there to be a romantic interest there because he wasn't even supposed to be in the book. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. But yeah, I mean, clearly there. I, I think there is a spark between them. I I don't like. I said I didn't really want to bring that to the forefront um, because I didn't really want to. You know, it wasn't what the book was about. Now, are we going gonna to get in the way of things? Now, are we going to find out anything about him and Maddie and Rose under fire? I don't know. If every time I say to you, I don't know, <laughs> you go, "Oh, right." Well, that'll be a yes then. <laughs> well, just Maybe. and you know what? Then we'll be pleasantly surprised. Okay, <laughs> or maybe unpleasantly surprised. But it, either way, it's fine because. Um, we saw something there in, you know, Coding Verity, and we'll just imagine there's a happily ever after, even if you don't write about it. <laughs> you can always imagine. You know, that's that's another reason I don't like saying yes or no, or, you know, to any direct question like what happened to so-and-so afterwards, because basically if there isn't an afterwards that I've produced, if I say yes, then that then you're going to say, all right, the author has said yes, then, then yeah. that's happened. You go, okay, they all got, they all get, they all get bombed next week, you know. <laughs> then you'll have to go, oh, they're all dead now. Yay. Don't kill them all off. Now, do you have plans for, um, oh, wait. Oh, if I don't say anything, <laughs> if I don't tell you them, you can then grapple, you know, whatever they want to. And you know, so you do that's, realize that's, that's, that's maybe one reason. You do that, realize that, that now you have opened the door for fan fiction. Back. <laughs> Everyone now is going to be writing fan fiction about Maddie and Jamie. <laughs> if there isn't already. <laughs> do you know there there is there, oh there is some there is some actually there's I would say there's more fan fiction about Woo! Maddie and Julie than there is about really Maddie and Jamie. Um, but there's, 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 yeah, if you go to, I, I'm not supposed to be doing this, am I? <laughs> this is bad for an author to be promoting, promoting other people's fan fiction. But if you, if you, um, look at, oh, what's it called? Oh, we can find it. I think it's called Archive of Our Own. <clears throat> I think it's called Archive of Our Own. Um, and... You know, just do a, a search on Code and Dirty. There's a pile of fan fiction there. Oh. 
if you're interested in such in such. Oh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Um, I think Allie came back. Allie, do you have a question before we wrap up? I'm waiting to see. I don't even know if she can hear me. I'm here typing. I'm going to assume no for now. Oh, wait. Oh, she says that she, she, because she just came in, she said that she's sad about missing all the talk about Jamie Madden. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch the video later. <laughs> she yeah, says, you know, no, he didn't say that much. It was just me giggling and going, ee hee hee hee, I'm not going to tell you anything. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Which is okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Cool. Um, I was just wondering if the question was ever answered about whether, like, the characters would reappear. Yep. If. What's the answer? If. Yes, yeah. if. 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 I, 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 this, is what, this is what you've been given. Maddie reappears. <laughs> that, that's okay, though. That's, anything else. that's totally an answer. I'm accepting that. Okay. <laughs> and we kept asking about, like, everyone else, and she's just like... <laughs> I don't know. I think it's it's still there. I will take that. <laughs> we will too. Now, do you, is it just? Uh, do you have yes, plans? Maddie, Maddie is. Um, uh oh. Can you hear me? What? Can you hear me? Sorry. Go Ooh. ahead. What were you saying? And then I I'll can ask. hear you. I can hear you. I I need to I need to warn you that our internet shuts down in. Oh. 15 minutes. No. <laughs> no problem. Either way, I was going to wrap up anyways. I just wanted to, um, and now I forgot my train of thought, so it doesn't even matter. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I was going to do. Writing advice. Oh, yeah, there you go. Writing and researching advice. What writing and researching advice do you have? Writing and researching advice. Um... <clears throat> You know, I always start with a book. I, I try to find a book that's like a, a good source for whatever it is that I'm interested in. And kind of use that as my Bible. Um, and then branch out from there. I, I think um, that also what is very good advice is if you're going to write about something that you need to research, it should be something you're passionate about because then the research will be interesting. You know, you don't want to have to plow through a pile of stuff that is actually boring you to death. Um, and my second book, A Coalition of Lions, is the first one that I wrote that was set in um, 6th century Ethiopia. And it took, it, there are 10 years between the publication of my first book and my second book. And it's because the research was so daunting. I just kept thinking, I can't, I, I don't know where to start. And once you do start, you know, once you start picking at that, you know, <clears throat> lay it at a rock face, you do eventually get somewhere. Um, what if I had hanging over my desk for a long time, a, a quotation from <laughs> the Hellblazer comic book, which was, um, I believe, actually written by Jamie Delano at the time. And it was things like archaeology. You scrape beneath your trowel, shape starts to form. So finally you reveal the face of perfect beauty, the plan. And so don't be daunted by the research. Find a way to break into it. Find a small topic within the larger topic that you can focus on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, research and writing, great, big, enormous, you know, subject, you know, it doesn't just apply right. to historical fiction, it can apply to, you know, anything. If I were writing a book about, if I were writing a book about train conductor. <laughs> you know in on the northeast railway line that runs up and down 
from London to Scotland, I wouldn't know anything about it. I'd have to start researching. So, you know, just as long as it's something you're interested in, there will be a way to get into it. I hope that helps. <laughs> no, it did. Thank you. Um, and I have one last question. Um, are, do you have any plans or hopes of staying in this, for lack of a better word, world um, era of these characters and this time period um, after Rose Under Fire, or are you working on something new? I'm working on something different. I'm working on something different, which is in, in, in such an early stage that I'm not really going to talk about it. But, I mean, I haven't talked about it to my editor as much either. But, but it's set it's set within 10 years of this. Um, so historicalism. So, yeah, it, it's kind of the same time frame, but probably a bit earlier. We'll take it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. We really had so much fun talking with you, despite all of the um, internet glitches. And, um, and thanks for everybody for coming in and chatting, too. Uh, before you go, just let us know when we can expect Rose Under Fire in bookstores. In the U.S., it, it should be out in September. Amazon now says September 10th. So Yay! September 10th. It's That's so <laughs> Um <laughs> Well, we really enjoyed Codename Verity, and I'm sure that we're going to love um, Rose Under Fire just as much. And hopefully if we do it for Book Club again this year, we would love to have you again. And um, it was a blast. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank right. you for having me. Of course. This kind of Glad it works. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 <clears throat>